असतो मा सद्गमय तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्युर्मा अमृत गमय ओ शाति 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 ओम लीडर्स फ्रॉम द अनरियल टू द रियल लीडर्स फ्रॉम डार्कनेस एंड टू लाइट लीडर्स फ्रॉम डेथ टू इमोटैलिटी ओम पीस 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 Uh, the first question is from Florence Lentini. How do you reconcile God with consciousness? If I am consciousness, which is the only reality, then I am God. How is it that Vedantins worship God, but at the same time teach that I am Brahman or God? When I try to realize my true self, how can I also worship God? Are the two the same? this is a standard question which comes up when you study advaita vedanta if i worship god only because first of all god is something different from me and if my self is one with god if i am one with god then how can i worship god it's like worshiping myself then so how do you reconcile this and yet there is in advaita vedanta there is full fledged bhakti and devotion and worship of god so how do you reconcile this Uh, the story which sri ramakrishna was fond of and in a parable about hanuman and ramachandra sri ramachandra who is an avatar an incarnation of god asks hanuman what do you think of me what do you think of me or how do you regard me and hanuman says deha buddhya dasoham jeeva buddhya tvadankshakam atma buddhya tu tvameva aham iti me nischita amati now this verse it solves this uh, problem the question which is asked here this is the answer what does it mean as a body identified with this hanuman body i am hanuman i am your servant you are rama my master thou art my master i am thy servant this is um, a devotional approach that you are my lord i am your servant then i am also a sentient being i am not just this body hanuman says that i am this sentient being this being with um, consciousness and mind and i have had many births earlier so this sentient being is is part of the divinity you are the all encompassing divinity i am thy part as a jiva i am your part and then as pure consciousness what the questioner is asking as consciousness itself i and you are one reality this is my conviction what is the answer as body as an hanuman i am the servant you are my lord as um, the sentient being you are the whole i am thy part and as uh, pure consciousness you and i are one reality the first one is uh, dualistic dvaita the second one is um, uh, qualified um, uh, monism vishishta dvaita part and whole relationship i am your part and the third one is non dualism the um, identity of the human and the divine so it shows how one can be devotional and also regard oneself as identical with brahman the question might be yes yes i know all that but i am asking about the third one when you regard yourself as one with brahman that i and that reality we are one reality then how do you worship brahman so it it is like this here the concept of two truths is very useful paramarthik satyam and vyavaharik satyam the absolute truth and the transactional truth um the absolute truth is that there is only one reality existence consciousness bliss brahman one without a second and everything else everything that you see in this world is an appearance of that one reality in reality one in appearance many see the many in appearance cannot be denied because we are experiencing it Now, any philosophy whether it is dualistic non dualistic whatever it is has to accept that we are seeing a pluralistic universe because that's already there it's it's being experienced now you have to explain it advaita vedanta says this is one appearing as many so 
वन नॉन ड्यूअल नॉन ड्यूअल रियालिटी एकम एव अद्वितीयम वन विदाउट अ सेकेंड दैट्स द रियालिटी दैट्स द अल्टीमेट ट्रुथ पारमार्थिक सत्य बट देर इज ऑल्सो अ लेवल ऑफ मल्टीप्लिसिटी वेर वी आर एक्सपीरियंसिंग डिफरेंस इन दिस वर्ल्ड नाउ गॉड वर्ल्ड एंड सेंटियन बींग ईश्वर जगत जीव दिस ट्राइंगल इज द एम्पेरिकल ट्रुथ द लोअर ट्रुथ द रिलेटिव ट्रुथ व्यवहारिक सत्यम I am a sentient being I am an individual being and here is this world and there is a god who is the creator preserver and the, the destroyer of this world the omniscient omnipotent omnipresent god so this is relative truth vyavaharika satyam the absolute truth is that i and that god are one reality that brahman alone exists and appears as many again one might ask what is all these two truths truth can only be one how can there be two truths Uh, but there can be when you uh, read a novel when you watch a cinema don't you discuss the plot of the cinema who did what as if it is real yeah. so there are two levels of reality you are, you are uh, inhabiting uh, a level in the movie or in the novel and your own reality are they equal no they are not equal one is fictional the other one is what we consider to be real similarly the two truths one is real brahman and the other one is a level of appearance so aren't you saying ultimately then the brahman alone is real and then god is a part of appearance here one has to be careful that absolute reality brahman non dual reality when it appears as this universe then where is that non dual reality it is saguna brahman it is god that same non dual reality is the god of religion Uh, then what is this but then you can say that uh, i am also the god uh, i am also the same brahman correct and this world it's an appearance of that same brahman the same non dual brahman appears as this world and is nothing but the god of religion ishwara saguna brahman and is identical with you brahma satyam jagat mithya jeeva brahmai vanapara brahman alone is real the world is an appearance of that brahman and you the jiva are none other than that brahman uh so but in this uh, discussion god is left out you're talking about me the world and brahman what about god ishwar asaguna brahman see if you are none other than god in brahman what about poor ishwar a god is god anything other than brahman god is all, it's, it's the same is none other than brahman the non dual brahman of uh, the paramarthika the absolute reality is the saguna brahman in advaita vedanta you talk about two brahmans two brahmans not that there are two there is higher brahman para brahman apara brahma the lower or relative brahman which is the brahman that you relate to notice when hanuman said as a body as the pers- as this person hanuman i am your servant you are my lord he is setting up a relation you are my master i am your servant at this level of our existence you have to set up a relation with god master and servant or friend like arjuna and krishna he regarded krishna as his friend or father and child mother and child sometimes you can say god or um, uh, is my father or mother like sri ram krishna regarded god as mother or you can be the father or mother and god is your child like the baby krishna or the baby jesus that's the point of um having a baby form of god to love and revere so that you can re- relate to it as a child or the beloved god is my beloved like the gopis or like uh, radha and krishna these are all relations so vedanta what it does is it divinizes our human relations and humanizes our divine relationship you set up a human relationship with god and you divinize your relationships with the all human beings you see god in all human beings um so that is the answer and so that is not very clear so am i supposed to worship god or not yes you are <laughs> even as a non dualist yes you are why because as long as we are firmly identified with one body and mind we need the help of god 
Just, just think about it. Whether you regard yourself as Brahman or not. Right now, are you not eating, talking, walking, going to the bank, um, going to your office, uh, relaxing? Uh, all of these. Does Brahman go to the bank? Does Brahman uh, eat, drink, walk around? No. When you are doing all these activities throughout your day, how, in what identity are you acting? As the individual being. If you can eat food when you are hungry, if you lie down on a bed and sleep when you are tired, when you need money, you go to the bank and get money or the ATM and get money. What harm has poor God done that you can't worship God? Spare a little time for worshipping God also. This is part of the same level of transactional reality. Now, why would you do that? One is, we need the help of God. For what? For leading a good, safe, protected, uh, useful, worldly life. And for spirituality. Krishna says, those who are in the world, they, need, they are in suffering in the world, they worship me. Those who are not suffering, but they need something in this world, you know, more success, a better life, they worship me. Those who are spiritual seekers, those who seek knowledge and devotion and liberation, moksha, salvation, they worship me. So we are all spiritual seekers. You worship God because you need the help of God for enlightenment. The most powerful help that you get in this universe is God. And God wants us, wants you to be enlightened. So you take the help of God. Now one more question remains. After I'm enlightened, then that means when I know I am Brahman, then I don't have to worship God anymore. Krishna says, the, the, the enlightened ones are also those who worship me. Artha, Atharthi, uh, uh, Artha, Jigyasu, Atharthi, Gyanicha. The four kinds of devotees. Those who worship for some worldly need. Those who worship because they want enlightenment. And those who worship because they are already enlightened. If you are already enlightened, why will you worship God? You know you are Brahman. Then why are you worshipping God? Uh, Bhagavatam says, Itham bhuta harer gunaha. Such are the extraordinary qualities of the Lord. That you cannot, the enlightened one cannot but uh, pour himself out in love and devotion to God. It's not a sign of enlightenment to say that, oh, now I've become enlightened, I don't need God anymore, goodbye. No, it's a sign of enlightenment that for the first time you be God becomes real for you. Swami Brahmananda said, spiritual life begins after Nirbhikalpa Samadhi. <laughs> because Sri Krishna says, among all the devotees, those who worship me, who, those who worship God, it is the jnani, the enlightened one, who is the best devotee. Anyway, so that's the answer. Let's take another one. Uh, this question is from Abel Abraham from Winnipeg in Canada. Uh, greetings, Swamiji. I grew up as a Christian and have a deep love of Jesus Christ. I have been listening, reading, and watching many videos about Advaita Vedanta over the last five years. What is amazing is that the knowledge I have gained in Advaita Vedanta over the years not only helped my spiritual life to blossom, but also deepened my love of Christ too. I love the Bible and the Panchadashi. They cause no conflict at all, except that it is easier for me to say I am Brahman, but tend to have no courage to say I am Jesus Christ. Could you help me on how to make such a statement correctly? Thank you, Swamiji. You cannot make such a statement correctly. <laughs> Uh, this, But what uh, Abel has said is wonderful. First of all, before I get to the question, first of all, this is the mission of Vedanta. When Swami Vivekananda, on uh, 11th September in 1893 in the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago and stood up to speak about Hinduism and about Vedanta, uh, that was also 9-11, by the way. Uh, we are sitting here in New York. Here 9-11 means only one thing. Uh, the death, destruction and religious fanaticism. But there was another 9-11 that was in Chicago in 1893 in the World Parliament of Religions where Swami Vivekananda talked not about just toleration but universal acceptance uh, about these, not only tolerating diversity of religions but celebrating the diversity and, and the harmony of religions. So there the question arose that, uh, so what is the mission of Vedanta then in the West? Are you here to convert people into Vedantins? And his answer was, no. He says, do, do I want that a, a Christian should become a Hindu? He says, God forbid. 
Is it, do I want that a, a Muslim should become a Christian? God forbid. Or a Buddhist should become a Zoroastrian? God forbid. Then what do I want? I want that a Hindu should become a better Hindu. A Muslim should become a better Muslim and a Christian should become a better Christian. Um, this is exactly what Abel is saying here. That by studying Vedanta, my love for Jesus has deepened. Um, that means my understanding of the Bible, my understanding of Jesus Christ and uh, love for True spirituality, which is at the core of every religion, including Christianity, that has deepened. And that is the success of Vedanta. Th that is the real purpose. Why, why is Vedanta here on American soil? It's this, for this purpose. I rem remember a remarkable conversation. Um, long after Vivekananda had passed, Nivedita had passed. Uh, Nivedita, you know, she was brought up uh, Protestant. She was of Irish descent. Uh, and in England. Now somebody asked a disciple of Swami Vivekananda, so how did Vivekananda make Nivedita Hindu? And this Swami Vivekananda's uh, disciple answered, oh, I don't think he made her Hindu. Although all the uh, you know, documentation, Nivedita's own writing and everything shows that she considered herself a Hindu, you know, like uh, as Hindu as everybody else. But this disciple said, very interesting comment he made, I don't think Swami Vivekananda made her a Hindu. I think he made her a better Christian. What a beautiful statement, a sentiment, yes. So the core spirituality in every religion, that is brought out by Vedanta, correct. Now, the particular question that Abel asks, I can regard myself as Brahman without fear. Good for you. You should. I am Brahman. Everybody should say that and own up to it that I am existence consciousness please it's an obvious fact but I hesitate I'm afraid to say I have no courage to say that I'm Jesus Christ don't <laughs> Shankaracharya points out long ago that the ocean the wave belongs to the ocean the ocean does not belong to the wave what Advaita Vedanta says God and you are the same reality not that you are God what is God and what you are are ultimately existence consciousness place. But it's like saying a bubble, a drop of water and a huge tsunami wave are both water. True they are. But as a bubble and as a tsunami wave they are very different. So when I think about what I am as this person, as able, and when I think about what I know about Jesus Christ, about Krishna, about Rama, about Ramakrishna, as this person and that divine personality, I find a huge difference. And that difference is almost unbridgeable. That's the difference between the human and the divine. That's the difference between an ordinary sentient being and an avatar, the incarnation of God. That's a huge difference. And Advaita doesn't want you to bridge that difference. Advaita says that difference is an appearance in that, what we were talking about just earlier. That the second level of truth in this empirical world. Thou art the master, I am thy servant. Thou art my Lord, I am thy devotee. This is all right. To so Jesus Christ, I am your dev devotee. Abel is the devotee of Jesus Christ. But what Jesus Christ is really, existence, consciousness, bliss, uh, and what Abel is really, existence, consciousness, bliss. We are identical at that level. Like Hanuman said, as Hanuman, you are my Lord, I am thy servant. So as Abel, Jesus is my Lord and I am thy servant. But as pure consciousness, you and I are one reality. But there, that pure consciousness is no longer Jesus, no longer able. It is just one non-dual reality. So at our level of existence, never equate yourself with God. That's, that's, um, that's mania. <laughs> you are fundamentally, at the, at the deepest level, one with God. At this transactional level, when you, the moment you say Jesus Christ, the moment you say I, I means Abel, clearly they are not one and the same. So this difference must be maintained. And that is a helpful difference to maintain. This question is from Peter de Grazia. Good morning, Swamiji. During these times of tension in the world, various gurus, swamis and others request that we pray for world peace by doing mantras or slokas, etc. To whom are we praying? After all, you say that we should remember that I am none other than Brahman and the world is an appearance in me. 
you see it is the same question <laughs> huh? yeah. that's why it's been arranged in the same way actually because it's basically the same question so in in these times uh, gurus swamis and all they are play, praying religious leaders are praying for world peace actually i was doing just that before this program there was a program um, an, an online program india canada canada consortium hinduism and humanity so everybody is talking about world peace and praying for that that's exactly what i was doing just now so it's the same question whom are we praying to if there is only one reality if i am brahman who are we praying to i had this remarkable experience 2 years ago in boston uh, a couple of scientists kidnapped me i mean not really but i'm just joking they said we want to ask you a question i said all right and where will you go we we'll, let's go to uh, find a there was the library at harvard uh, was very busy so uh, we decided to go to mit and find a place and then when they realized that i had not seen mit they said come with us we'll give you a tour and before going to mit we went to this very secret uh, at least semi secret location classified location uh, it's a nuclear power plant where they are doing fusion uh, experiments trying to design a fusion rea- uh, reactor uh, in the heart of boston underground it's there and it's an old es- uh, establishment started um, during the manhattan project so we went in there the, i was given a tour of that this amazing project i mean amazing establishment huge massive so we, i was led to a classroom where the scientists gather for discussions about nuclear fusion and there was a blackboard I, and uh, i went there and then they said here is our question what is the question same question if advaita vedanta says we are one reality then how does how do advaitins worship god so same question who are you praying to if there is one reality see the moment you say i am praying for what world peace already you have accepted world and there is war in the world and you want peace in the world there is covid in the world you want a freedom you want us to, uh, to be to escape from covid and you who is praying is brahman praying or is this person praying this person is praying the moment you accept the person and you accepted the world you have also accepted god and you are praying to god there's no problem there the problem arises when i say see at, at the heart of this lies this uh, confusion that i am brahman means i this person am brahman as person but the question will be then if i the person am not brahman i am only a person what else am i So when you say I am Brahman, you must mean this. I am this person who is Brahman. No, that's why Advaita Vedanta requires little close attention, uh, following it through carefully. Um, what does Advaita Vedanta do? It starts with who you are, and it does not say who you are is Brahman. It first starts with what do you think you are? I am this person. What is this person? This body? Yes. And then the whole process of inquiry starts. are you this body and then we are inquired to say that i cannot exactly be this flesh and bone and uh, you know mass of organic material then we go further uh, are you uh, the prana the physiological processes are you life itself we go deeper and subtler are you the mind many people stop there yes i am a mind embodied in a body but when the same but we do, you know we do the panchakosha viveka and vedanta we see how we are not the mind also body is there prana is there mind is there then am i the intellect which is doing all this understanding this all this discussion philosophy and inquiry that also we have the same logic what is the logic we have discussed it many times in these uh, talks so we cannot be the intellect also go beyond that you hit a blankness nothing but that blankness is also experienced then we realize that we are the consciousness we are the awareness in sanskrit so many words are there chit sakshi chiti samvit bodha all of them mean the same thing the awareness to which everything appears what are you you are awareness that awareness which is the witness of that mind of that intellect of that prana of that body that awareness is called the witness consciousness or sakshi now this witness consciousness is brahman you can say this witness consciousness pure awareness 
is Brahman, then the statement is correct. But that witness consciousness, Sakshi, limited by a mind, limited by a body, becoming this person Sarva Priyananda, is this Brahman? Not quite. It is an appearance of Brahman. But you cannot literally say this particular person is Brahman in that sense. So when you say, I, when I pray to God, as a person, I pray to God. When Abel says, I cannot say I am one with Jesus Christ. Yes, as a person, you should not say I am one with Jesus Christ. I, I worship Jesus Christ. Before that, um, Fellini, I think, the first person who asked the question. Florence. Florence. Uh, Florence was asking, how do you worship God uh, in Advaita Vedanta? Is you worship God as the individual being. Now, I just want to add here, just for the sake of completion. So from a non-dualist perspective, is it necessary to worship God? Strictly, philosophically speaking, logically speaking, no. You can inquire into what am I and reach the truth and that's it. Work is done. But then how many people can do it? Life is a marathon struggle through many different kinds of problems and your challenges, both worldly and spiritual. So we need the help, the help of divinity. And it makes the whole spiritual life more joyful and blessed also when you worship God. All right. This question comes from Arpan Sen. I have realized from my own dream experiences that the material of my dream is completely borrowed from my real experiences. They are, however, rearranged to build a fresh narrative that plays as my dream reality. The question is, where does my waking reality get its material from, considering there is no higher plane of reality to borrow materials from? Is there any explanation other than Maya or error? Right. Answer is, where does the waking reality borrow its material? If it doesn't borrow, it, it is just uh, your experience of what is out there. See, what Arpan is asking is that uh, when I consider my dream experiences, the people I saw in the dream, the, the places I visited, the good and bad experiences I had, when I wake up, I can coordinate it with my waking experience and realize it is just the impressions, the memories, the traces of these waking experiences which have been reconstituted by the sleeping mind, the dreaming mind into my dream experiences. What I experience in the waking life, it leaves memories in the mind and out of that is constituted my dream experience. Sometimes the fears in the waking world, the anxieties, they reflected in the dream. Sometimes the desires which are not fulfilled in the waking world are reflected in the dream. Sometimes it's just chatter from the waking world which is reflected in the dream. But where do these experiences of the waking world come from? The answer is simple. Where do you think they come from? From the waking world. Why do they have to be borrowed from another world? See, this is why you consider dream world to be false and the waking to be real. Quite apart from Vedanta, your common sense approach. What do you think about your dreams? Oh, they are dreams. They are not real. What do you think about the waking world? This is real. Not as a philosophical point of view. This is the accepted reality of our lives. We talk, behave in this way that this is real. So you are contacting an external world outside you through your eyes and ears and touch and smell and taste. We are talking with people, um, interacting with people, having good and bad experiences. That's where you get the experience of waking world. From the waking world. From an external world. Why bring in maya or error into it? Now at this point, Arpan will be confused. This does not sound like an Advaitin. According to Advaitin, isn't it all like a dream? Uh, so the dream world is borrowed from the waking. The waking world is also a dream. It must be borrowed from something else. That's what he is pointing towards. Now, first things first, that one must see... That Advaita Vedanta is not subjective idealism. Those who are well trained in philosophy will understand. What Arpan is thinking, Advaita Vedanta is subjective idealism in the Berkeleyan sense, in the Buddhist Yogachara Vijnana, the mind only school sense. No. This is one talk I want to do make a distinction between Advaita Vedanta and the idealistic school of 
ಬುದ್ಧಿಸಮ್ ದ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಸ್ಕೂಲ್ ಚಿತ್ತ ಮಾತ್ರ ಆರ್ ದಿ ವಿಜ್ಞಾನವಾದ ಯೋಗಾಚಾರ ವಿಜ್ಞಾನವಾದ ಸ್ಕೂಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಬುದ್ಧಿಸಮ್ ದ ಟೂ ಆರ್ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ದಿವೋಟ್ಸ್ ಅ ಹ್ಯೂಜ್ ಅಮೌಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಫರ್ಟ್ ಟು ಡಿಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ವಿಷಿಂಗ್ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಫ್ರಾಮ್ ಐಡಿಯಲಿಸ್ಟಿಕ್ ಬುದ್ಧಿಸಮ್ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಐಡಿಯಲಿಸ್ಟಿಕ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಫಿಲಾಸಫಿಕಲ್ ಸೆನ್ಸ್ ವಿಜ್ಞಾನವಾದ ಬುದ್ಧಿಸಮ್ ವಾಯ್ the philosopher arindam chakravarti has written a very nice paper idealist refutations of idealism how particular idealist schools refute idealism you would think when the buddhists say the whole world is in our minds there's no world outside you would think shankaracharya would agree no much better is to treat it like a realist what is realist think about your common sense view of the world what is your common sense view of the world i am here world is out there it's not in my mind i am here there is a world and i'm contacting a world which is a diverse world not one existence consciousness place the diverse world of living and non living things i'm contacting it with my senses and i'm dealing with it as best as i can this is a common sense view of life you can call it a realist view of life and advaita vedanta actually agrees i'll go deeper into it at some occasion Adv- this is the answer to arpan's question advaita vedanta does not say that the waking world is a product of my mind dream world is a product of dreaming mind this waking mind when it falls asleep asleep it dreams a world but this waking world is not a product of the mind then why does advaita say the world is false advaita says the world is false because the world is an appearance in consciousness well then comes to the same thing my no mind and consciousness are not the same thing there is an individual mind and there is this whole world individual mind and body are as real as this world both are appearances in one consciousness this is what advaita vedanta is trying to say advaita vedanta is not that is not saying that each of us goes around imagining our own worlds we do but that's not the uh, whole of it there from our individual perspective there is a very solid real world outside from your real perspective of your real nature which is satchidananda awareness itself from that perspective the whole world and this individual are both appearances the dream example itself if you follow it carefully it will become clear in the dream suppose you are walking around talking with friends sharing a cup of coffee and a cookie so there is a friend outside there is a place where you are sitting there is a table there is presumably cups of coffee and cookies and maybe you are talking maybe you are so you are seeing things hearing things smelling tasting uh, drinking and there are there is you and other people presumably you have a body so you are an individual in the dream and there is a world with which you are interacting in the dream but both that individual and this world are products of the dreaming mind that world in the dream is not a product of that dream individual as the person follow this carefully as the person in the dream sitting and uh, in interacting with your friend and drinking a cup of coffee and eating a cookie that person is not dreaming that world there is an underlying sleeping dreaming mind which is dreaming up the entire world swami vivekananda said this one only exists it appears as nature soul one only exists consciousness it appears as this world nature soul the subject what does uh, subjective idealism say this subject is producing this world no or this subject is imagining this world no this is a difference idealist refutation of idealism why does uh, their professor arindam chakravarty delineates the arguments in s- favor of subjective idealism why do buddhists some buddhists and so philosophers like bishop berkeley uh, why do they think that this world is only in our minds and then how shankaracharya attacks these arguments people get confused why is shankar attacking the argument they seem to be in support of his position no he is carefully d- differentiating his position from subjective idealism and then professor chakravarti jumps from shankaracharya to immanuel kant 
who does exactly the same thing. He also attacks idealism, though he supports another sort of Vedantic kind of uh, absolutism. So where is the material of the waking world coming from? From the waking world. That's why you consider it to be real. Material of the waking world means here is this person. In a dream you might say, if it's a dream, then how, why did I see this person? Because in my waking world I must have seen a person, a similar person. In the waking world, why am I seeing that person? Because that person is there. That's why I'm seeing. How is this Advaita? Because I... The seer and that person seen are both appearances in one consciousness. So why does this confusion arise? Unless we carefully distinguish mind from consciousness and then look at the unlimited nature of consciousness. Until that point it will keep seeming that this world is a product of my mind. That's not what Advaita says. Okay, one more question, and then I'll call upon you. This question is from Mostro I. Dear Swami Savapriyananda, I love and admire you. You have been the biggest, strongest rope with which I pulled myself up from suicide. My family and friends thank you. I thank you beyond any words. I am learning the principles of Advaita Vedanta, Please forgive me if my questions are naive. I have the following questions. How is the Advaita expressed by Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj different if it is different from that expressed by you and the Ramakrishna order? Two, in our dreams we can be ourselves, different people, realistic animals, and even imaginary creatures like dragons. By seeing how ephemeral our identities are in dreams and often in our waking state as well, does that not demonstrate clearly that our identities are mere reflections of universal awareness? All right. The first question is actually a general and wide question of how um, Nisarga Dattas Advaita differ, differs from the Advaita that we are talking about in the Ramakrishna order. I'll take that up second. The first, I'll take up the second question, which is, we see how ephemeral our identities are in the dreams. And then, uh, so aren't these waking identities also equally ephemeral? Aren't they all reflections of universal consciousness? Universal, aw universal awareness. Universal awareness. So why even use such indirect uh, language as reflections of universal awareness? Just say, these identities are appearances in universal awareness. Um, even Don't even use universal awareness. I mean, what is universal awareness? Is it awareness aware of a universe? Or is it an awareness spread over the universe? Uh, what just say awareness unlimited awareness um, so what is an identity that awareness not knowing its nature uh, somehow becomes one with a particular body mind this mind this body which are not awareness which are objects in awareness the awareness somehow says that I am this so two things are required here one is not knowing its own real nature, unlimited nature. And number two, um, becoming uh, aware of mind-body and saying, I am this much. So this is Ajnana, ignorance, and then error, Adhyasa, superimposition. Do not know myself, do not know the rope, think it is a snake. Do not know I am unlimited consciousness, I think I am body-mind. Not only think, I firmly believe and act as if I am body-mind. Yes, these identities are ephemeral. Notice, our um, individual identity can disappear. If there is a little stroke in the brain, then the mind also fails to function properly. The mind, this required, mind requires the brain as hardware. Just as your, if your hardware in a computer is not working well, your software also will not run well. It will keep crashing, there will be problems. Similarly, our identities get shaken or dissolved or distorted if, the, if there is a physical problem in the brain, if there are mental disorders. Our individual identities are very flimsy. 
age can affect senility can affect it um, various diseases like alzheimers and parkinsons can affect it a stroke can affect it mental uh, uh, illnesses can affect our identities our identities are very flimsy throughout it all one thing is constant awareness is constant if i'm confused about my identity if i'm suffering from amnesia identity loss or something i'm still aware that awareness does not go come and go so awareness is our real identity which it is not based on choice it is not based on accident not based on body mind it is our real identity now the first question is interesting how does the uh, advaita which we are speaking about differ from the sargadatta's advaita it doesn't first of all the core principle is the same there is one unlimited awareness brahman uh, in which the entire world is an appearance and you are brahman that's the same somebody asked nisargadatta who lived by the way in a slum in mumbai when he became enlightened uh, he started walking towards the himalayas i love this story he started walking towards the himalayas i don't need any of this i want to live in the mountains for the rest of the life of this particular body and then he stopped himself what am i doing have i not realized that it's same reality whether it is the himalayas or the slum both are appearances in one pure brahman then why should i switch this awful slum for the sublime himalayas no and he came back and he lived the rest of his life in that terrible place this is a sign of enlightenment you really see the underlying sameness and you base your actions on that now what he did was he stuck to that one central teaching again and again and again in his in his books you will find the why, why it seems a little different is because the teachings you find in the english books i think i am that that is the name of the book probably i am that and other books also have been published they are originally in marathi his talks are in marathi and they were translated by uh, in, uh, you know his interlocutors into english so the terminology can be can sometimes seem a little confusing little different from classical advaita vedanta but the core message is the same but how is it different it is same as what nisargadatta maharaj said and ramana maharshi said it is the same thing but how is it different then what we do in the ramakrishna order is first classical advaita vedanta as taught by shankara and post shankara advaitins and then broaden it out one characteristic of the ramakrishna order sri ramakrishna swami vivekananda ma sharada and all the other teachers down to our age is the inclusivity is the universality of approach so it is not just non dualism against dualism uh, it's not non dualism of the advaita variety against all other philosophies religions no uh, from vivekananda's perspective or sri ramakrishna's perspective there is one reality whether it is dualism dvaita vedanta vishishta dvaita vedanta qualified monism or the other schools of vedanta including non dualism all of them are approaching the same reality experiencing and trying to express the same reality in different ways it's the like the five blind men touching the elephant so they are all touching the same elephant one calls it my narayana my vishnu or my durga or kali another one says this is brahman and it's the entirety of the universe all of it is one reality one divine reality i am a tiny part of that sun and i am a tiny ray of the sun blazing fire i am a spark from that blazing fire is upanishadic language and the other one the non dualism says that um, not that i i uh, you, are, you are god and i am your worshipper not that uh, you are the totality brahman is the totality <coughs> i am a part of it rather we are one reality the difference of brahman and the and the devotee or the part and whole relationship these are appearances if you see see a character in a movie on the movie screen is that character in the movie screen different from the movie screen but different i mean can the character exist and the movie screen exist separately no that character in the movie screen appears on the movie screen it's an appearance on the movie screen can we say well the character is a, that movie that person in the movie is a part of the movie screen 
it's not a part of the movie screen that's so which part the top part bottom part the, uh, which switch of the movie what happened did that part will disappear will will, will be a big hole in the screen no it's not even a part of the screen it's not different from the screen it's not a part of the screen it's not even produced by the screen it is an appearance even more so is this entire universe an appearance in awareness that's how we all experience the world everything is appearing to us the awareness in us the awareness and if you think deeply about it as nothing but us the awareness so this reality you can approach it non dualistically that's what ramana maharshi did that's what nisargadatta did and they stopped there and they emphasized this notice being hindu they are also very deeply inclusive so if somebody comes and says i love to worship my god my krishna i don't understand your advaita will ramana maharshi say that you are wrong no never he will say that's also all right and then he will try if possible from there try to find out who am i who is worshiping krishna if not fine you go on worshiping your krishna that will also help so this is the spirit in principle same advaita vedanta which is there in the upanishads taught by godapada shankara and the post shankara advaitins down to ramakrishna vivekananda nisargadatta ramana maharshi in principle it's the same thing the core idea is the same now some may emphasize the uh, core principle the transcendent part of it more some may emphasize the immanent part of it more some may make take a much more much broader more inclusive universal approach uh, that's the only difference all right uh, will you come and ask the question please come up here and tell us your name and where you are from and then ask the question oops sorry I'm Lakshmi Kulkarni. I'm from Bangalore, India, and uh, Swami Ji, Namaskar. I'm carrying warm regards to you from a whole bunch of friends in India who are your friends. I seek your blessings on behalf of all of them. Thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to clear our doubts. After being a sadhaka, practicing sadhana chatushtaya and chat sampatti, or at least believing that we get it intellectually. the feeling is okay got it now what next i have a couple of questions i'll just ask them together after having raga dvesha uh, and the six vices under control what should our focus be on or du- for during meditation because the idea is to clean the mirror when clean in our understanding but not having any experiences as such what is the next step forward and thank you for those kind words uh, and the the question the first question which you asked um, about having our vices under control having developed the qualities of viveka uh, discernment with internal and non eternal vairagya dispassion for the world the six fold disciplines uh, chat sampatti and an intense desire for liberation actually if somebody develops it to any particular level then all questions will disappear the advaitic truths will become pretty clear but an answer straight answer to your question is do what advaita vedanta always tells you to do engage in shravana manana nididhyasana in study of uh, advaitic texts under uh, you know a qualified teacher and nowadays you can do that you know through books and or youtube <laughs> and thinking about it and when clarity is obtained meditating upon it shravana manana nididhyasana one may say yes 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 swami i know all that we have done it not done it if you have done it you think you have done it then repeat <laughs> one teacher said nicely that if you say i have already studied vedanta but i have not obtained enlightenment then repeat it i have repeated I repeat again <laughs> how long will i repeat will keep on repeating till the end of this life suppose i don't have obtain enlightenment by the end of this life better luck next life <laughs> there is no other way other than to stay with it until enlightenment comes all right now the second question is when i sit in meditation and i'm not getting any experiences what should i do i have clean, clean, cleansed the mirror now what Well, first of all, let's not be too clear that we have cleansed the mirror. Uh-huh. As good old Freud said, 
A lot of the dirt is not on the surface of the mirror. The mirror has its own st stockpile of dirt. We clean the mirror and the moment we look away and look back again, the old mirror has got a <laughs> layer of dirt on it. Where did it come from? It was always there. We didn't see it. So the process of cleansing the mirror, that is chitta shuddhi, it goes on. But a deeper question is, all right, I'm trying to have meditation. It seems peaceful. Nothing is coming. Here, what Advaita says is, that nothing is coming is also noticed, is it not? That when some experience is coming, worldly experience, I shut it down. I sit and quietly and meditate. I'm sitting quietly and meditating. Is it not noticed that yes, I'm sitting quietly and meditating? That some disturbance came in the mind and then I controlled it. Was that also not experienced? That there was a disturbance in the mind and I controlled it. Now mind is peaceful. Is that not experienced? Now I am not getting peaceful mind, no experiences are coming. Spiritual experiences I was expecting, nothing is coming. Is that not experienced also? Serious is all these are experienced. That's why I'm asking you the question. But wait a minute. If all of these are being experienced, then what is experiencing all this? By what way? In what in what medium? In what reality? In to to what all these experiences are coming? That to which the worldly experiences, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, were coming, is the same thing, is it not, to which comes the experience of sitting and meditating? It is the same thing which experiences the disturbances in the mind. It is that same thing which um, experiences the peaceful mind. It is that very same thing which notes that no spiritual experiences are coming. In all of this, there is one constant reality to which all these experiences are happening. And that must be consciousness, awareness, chaitanya. Why? Because experience is happening. It's always awareness. Without awareness, experience might not happen. I mean, it should, will not happen. If you are not aware, there will not be any experience. So one thing you can say is constantly consciousness is there. Instead of looking for experience, you can have mystical spiritual experiences. If you take a mantra, visualize the Ishta Devata and repeat it, you will definitely at one time or the other, you will get the vision of the Ishta Devata. Those things are real. Mystical experiences do happen. But Advaita Vedanta is saying, whether worldly experience or mystical experience, both appear and disappear in the same awareness. Whether disturbed mind or peaceful mind, both appear and disappear in the same awareness. Only one thing is constant, will always has been there, is there now and will always be there with you. What is that? You, the awareness. Nothing else, no worldly experience will stay with you. Even the memories will fade away. No person will stay with you. Even the memories of that, those persons will fade away. No gathering of wealth, of um, Facebook likes will stay with you. Those will all fade away. No knowledge, or whether it is worldly knowledge, medicine, science or Vedantic knowledge, you have memorized many shlokas, none of that will stay with you. It will also fade away one day. Only one thing will stay with you. That you are this consciousness. That will be there. That consciousness which is experiencing all this. You might say, yeah, that's uh, not, not uh, wrong. But how does that help me? Now, notice the interesting features or the interesting um, nature of this consciousness. One is, it never goes away. It does not come, it does not go. Whatever comes and goes is experienced in that consciousness, by that consciousness. Because it does not come and go, it cannot age, it cannot die. It was the witness of the birth of the body. It was the witness of the development, babyhood, childhood of the body. It, it is the witness of the aging and one day it will be the witness of the death of the body. I, the consciousness, will still be there. So consciousness is immortal. What a huge thing this is. It sets you free from the fear of death. The deepest fear that we human beings have. The fear of not existing. Never be afraid. You will always exist. 
Krishna says to Arjuna, O oh Arjuna, you and I and all these kings and princes in the battlefield of Kurukshetra, you have all existed earlier, you are here now and you will continue to exist in the future. Your past lives, you do not know them, I know them all. So existence and consciousness are the same reality, Sat and Chit. It is immortal. And you are that immortal reality. The more you think about it, that's the great advantage you have. Then, peace, uh, relaxation. That consciousness is always at peace. It is peace itself. Shantam is the name of consciousness in Mandukya Upanishad. Disturbance of the mind is revealed by consciousness. Peace of the mind, meditative mind, is revealed by consciousness. You know, I was... Now mind has become peaceful, like you said. Too peaceful. No experiences are coming. This is too much peace. Something should happen. <laughs> I am reminded of this Zen cartoon, you know. The, the student has come to a Zen master. Zen master is teaching Zen meditation to the student. And this Zen master is saying with a very serious expression in that cartoon, he's saying to the student, this is it. Student is like, what? This is it. Nothing happens. That consciousness is always at peace. It was at peace when it rec uh, saw the disturbance of the mind. It is at peace when you see the, uh, the peaceful mind. It is at peace when the mind seems too peaceful and you want some ex excitement experience. Consciousness itself was never disturbed. Consciousness itself never became peaceful. Consciousness itself does not want one more experience. That is all the states of the mind. It is the mind which was disturbed, the mind which became meditative and peaceful. It is the mind which wants extraordinary spiritual experiences. Yes, I have calmed down all worldly experiences. I am quiet and inward. Now some spiritual experience please, it is too boring. <laughs> it is the mind which is doing all of that. Consciousness is completely at peace all the time. And uh, illumining all these coming and going, the, the thoughts in the mind, the desires in the mind, the restlessness in the mind, the peacefulness in the mind. This is called Shantam. So, the second great benefit, first benefit, don't forget, immortality, freedom from fear of death. Body will die. That one must accept. Nobody can save the body from dying. And nor should one be too worried about that. Nowadays in Silicon Valley, the billionaires are getting together to make the body immortal. So, why? You must ask why. You say, why not? I want to live forever. But that means I and body are same. You have made it the same. Cryogenic. Can I freeze the body? Or upload my personality into the cloud? At least that's a higher way of thinking. That means body is not important. Only the memories and feelings are important. There was even the talk of head transplant. A Russian doctor, he promised uh, that uh, there was one man who was paralyzed. He said, what do you want? I want to be able to ride a motorbike in California. Uh, so for that, what, what operation has to be performed? They will wait for a person who has died, in, in, I mean in coma, body is preserved. So they will get the body of that person and this patient, they will cut off the head of that body and cut off the head of this patient and freeze the head and then transplant this head into that new body. And hopefully the patient will wake up with a more active, like fully, then he can ride a motorbike. They did not try, hopefully they did not try it. Don't worry about body transplant. Every life we get a new body transplant. We have got thousands of body transplants and many more are available to you. <laughs> so no problem about that. Consciousness does not need body transplant. Consciousness is one and constant. So it's a great freedom. Freedom from fear of death. Freedom from restlessness, anxiety, unhappiness. Then oneness and love. Because you realize it is one consciousness in all bodies and minds. I will not go into the arguments for it because it is a huge topic. But it is one consciousness in all bodies and minds. Krishna says to Arjuna, Kshetragyam chapi maam vidhi sarva kshetreshu bharata. O Arjuna, know me to be the one consciousness in all these bodies. One knower of the field in all these fields. From this oneness, 
comes all ethics and love if we are you and i and everybody is one how can there be violence how can there be greed how can there be competition how can there be dislike of other people there is no other so these are the benefits of realizing this one consciousness thank you very good questions thank you thank you swami hmm? i think we can take one more question from the internet audience Uh, this question is from Anil Mathur. Swamiji, my question to you relates to the goal of self-realization. You had mentioned in one of your recent talks that you know of a small number of people personally who you believe are Jivan Mukti. I expect that these are monks who have devoted their lives to achieving the goal of self-realization. It follows then that even if you devote your whole life very few actually achieve self-realization what hope is there then for an ordinary householder is this even an achievable goal i also notice that associating our identity with the mind body seems to be hardwired into all living things humans and animals can we realistically hope to overcome something that seems to be part of what nature gave us and by us i am referring to the mind body complex i agree there is no higher goal than being able to live fearlessly unaffected by the ups and downs of life but it seems like even if you devote your whole life to it there is only a very small likelihood of success so the question is that there seems to be very few people who become enlightened why engage on this project you know that to become enlightened where the chances of success are so minimal uh, and it seems to be as he says few people are enlightened and they must be all monks it's not true that they are all monks uh, there are people who are monks or not monks householders they have been enlightened and even now continue to be so so every anybody can become enlightened but still the question remains how few so few then why start a process which will which chances are you will not get uh, f- um, freedom or enlightenment that reminds me of you know, in india they always see um, westerners the moment you feel spiritual in this country in america or in europe the first thing they do is they pack a backpack and take their passport and off they go to india they go to Hi- himalayas it's not necessary to go to the himalayas to become spiritual you can of course it's nice but uh, it it's not necessary now in india the idea is that yes it is possible to become enlightened but it's uh, very few people can become enlightened it's just just the opposite you see uh, when the f- wave of uh, immigrants started coming for 30 40 years ago the large wave of immigrants from india to the united states so the indian guy packs up uh, and gets a um, passport and a visa and comes to united states why not for enlightenment for becoming a millionaire and the american tells him it's not impossible but it's not guaranteed that you're going to become a millionaire just coming coming to the united states the same thing when the westerner lands with a backpack in uh, delhi or mumbai and i've come here for enlightenment the indian will tell him it's not impossible people have been known to become enlightened but it's not guaranteed that you're going to become enlightened very few become enlightened now then why at all start this process well the, this professor in uh, at harvard university professor parimal patel in one discussion this question came up and uh, he asked he was asking how few people you know become enlightened so why should at all anybody start this process so the three answers which emerged from our discussion was one answer is um that first of all everybody will become enlightened Sri Ramakrishna gives the example of Banaras which is the place of the divine mother Annapurna literally she who is who gives who fills you who, uh, who gives food to all those who seek so his food of course means spiritual uh, growth development and fulfillment so the example Sri Ramakrishna gives is in Banaras nobody goes hungry everybody will be fed only thing is some are fed in the morning some in the afternoon some may have to wait till sunset to be fed but everybody will be fed similarly 
in this universe everybody will ultimately get fulfillment god realization enlightenment moksha but some may get it early some may take a few lifetimes some may get it in this lifetime some may take a few lifetimes some have to wait till sunset what is sunset god sunset is the end of the universe a few billion years <laughs> pralaya maha pralaya some will get or maybe beyond that also many universes will come and go before some people who are little slow on enlightenment who haven't yet come to the vedanta society so they will take a little bit of time so first of all first answer is everybody will get enlightenment but you don't know when so it's 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 a guaranteed thing and why not you are brahman what can stop you from realizing yourself you may do some some other achievement in the world you may or may not attain enlightenment you will get it's guaranteed because you are brahman that's answer 1 The second answer is, once you have tasted this spiritual life, what else comes close to it? Hmm. That uh, uh, you know, I remember once as a young novice, after a few weeks, I think in the ashram, I told another uh, monastic novice, was too shy to go to the senior swamis, so another. somebody closer to me in age was saying that you know i'm not making much spiritual progress it was not even i think a month into my monastic life and then that always gave such a nice answer to me he was a senior to me he gave a nice answer which i've never forgotten till now she said okay go back home i said no i can't do that she said why not you spent the last 23 years in that home and you've just been here for less than one month and you feel you can't go back there you want to stay here then isn't this progress so once you taste spiritual life nothing else comes close everybody i know who for a long time uh, whether it's vedanta or devotional practices or japa or karma yoga save, serving others after some time when you ask them they say this is this is really a very precious part of my life this is something i cannot do without anymore i have become deeply attached to this this is a source of Uh, peace and joy to me the second so second answer is in the process of your journey towards eventual enlightenment you find this is the best thing that you have got in life spiritual life it could be meditation it could be vedantic study it could be devotion service a combination of all of these third answer which professor patel himself he gave uh, was a beautiful answer he says actually you know what motivates people in spiritual life it's not that i'm waiting enlightenment will come then only everything is done or before that there's no gain nothing it's not all or nothing it is the moment to moment day to day peace of mind meaningfulness of life a higher spiritual purpose something noble and beautiful in my life which gives me strength which gives me peace of mind day to day long before enlightenment that's what keeps people in spiritual life whether monks or householders which is correct स्वल्पम अप्यस्य धर्मस्य त्रायते महतो भयात इवन अ लिटिल प्रैक्टिस ऑफ धर्म ऑफ स्पिरिचुअलिटी सेव्स यू फ्रॉम ग्रेट फियर वी मे ऐड ग्रेट मीनिंगलेसनेस इन दिस डे एंड डे एंड लाइफ एंड दिस डे एंड एज रियल क्राइसिस इज द क्राइसिस ऑफ मीनिंगलेसनेस व्हाट इज द पर्पस ऑफ माय लाइफ वंस अपॉन अ टाइम इट वाज पर्पस ऑफ माय लाइफ वाज टू सरवाइव I have to gather food. I have to get security, protect myself, uh, take care of the family. And that itself was such a huge burden. People had no time for thinking of anything else. But now things are guaranteed. You live in a safe society, unless you are in Ukraine. You live in a safe society. You live where things are more or less stable, uh, prosperous. but then the question arises again that old ancient question what's the point of it all i have got enough to eat i've got enough for entertainment we have got protection from the elements weather and all uh, we are reasonably happy and engaged then very soon i'm going to get old and die and that's the end of this game what was the point of it all the question of meaninglessness arises again with redoubled force and then once the world has provided you with all it can reasonably what can it provide you this is what it can provide you once the world has provided you with all it can then the world has no more answer 
for your question of meaninglessness. Only spirituality has the answer. Spirituality gives meaning to life, an ultimate high goal and purpose to life. On that high and a uh, high note, let us conclude here. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu I pray to Thakur Maya and Swamiji to bless all of us. May the grace of God be upon all of us and protection of God be upon all here and all over the world. 